book two chapter fifteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter fifteen the most holy mary remains in the portal of the nativity until the coming of the magi kings by the infused knowledge of holy scriptures and her high supernatural enlightenment our great queen knew that the magi kings of the orient would come to acknowledge and adore her most holy son as their true god she was aware of it also more particularly because an angel had been sent to them to announce the birth of the incarnate word as mentioned in chapter second and the virgin mother was not ignorant of this message saint joseph had no foreknowledge of these mysteries because they had not been revealed to him nor had his most prudent spouse informed him of this secret in all things she was most wise and discreet awaiting the sweet and timely dispositions of the divine providence wisdom chapter eight verse one after the circumcision the holy spouse suggested to the mistress of heaven that they leave their poor and forsaken habitation on account of the insufficient shelter which it afforded the divine infant and to her for it would now be possible to find a lodging in bethlehem where they could remain until after presenting the child in the temple of jerusalem this proposal of the most faithful spouse arose from his solicitude and anxiety lest the child and the mother should want even that comfort and convenience which it was possible for their poverty to procure but he left it all to the disposition of his heavenly spouse without revealing the mystery the humble queen answered my spouse and master i resign myself to thy will and wherever thou wishest to go i will follow with great pleasure arrange it as thou pleasest the heavenly lady had an affection for the cave on account of its humbleness and poverty and because the incarnate word had consecrated it by the mysteries of his nativity and circumcision and was to hallow it by the mystery of the magi's visit although she did not know at what time that would happen this was a most pious affection full of devotion and reverence yet she preferred to give an example of the highest perfection in all things she considered it more important to resign and submit to saint joseph letting her spouse decide what was to be done while they were thus conferring with each other the lord himself informed them through the two celestial princes michael and gabriel who were attending in corporeal forms to the service of their lord and god and of their great queen they spoke to mary and joseph saying divine providence has ordained that three kings of the earth coming from the orient in search of the king of heaven should adore the divine word in this very place psalm seventy one verse six they are already ten days on the way for at the hour of the birth of jesus they were informed of it and they immediately set out on their journey therefore they will shortly arrive fulfilling all that the prophets had from very ancient times foreknown and foretold by this announcement saint joseph was instructed on his part concerning the will of the lord and mary his most holy spouse said to him my master this place chosen by the most high for such magnificent mysteries although it is poor and ill furnished in the eyes of the world in the sight of eternal wisdom is rich precious and the most estimable and preferable on this earth since the lord of heaven is satisfied with it and has consecrated it by his presence he who is the true land of promise can favor us with his vision in this place and if it is his pleasure he will afford us some protection and shelter against the inclemencies of the weather during the few days in which we are to stay here saint joseph was much consoled and encouraged by these words of the most prudent queen he answered her that since the divine child was to fulfill the law which required him to be present in the temple just as he had subjected himself to the law of circumcision they could remain in this sacred place until that day should arrive without first undertaking the distant and wearisome journey to nazareth during the inclement weather if perhaps the severity of the season would compel them to seek shelter in the city they could easily do so since from bethlehem to jerusalem there was only a distance of two hours in all these matters the most holy mary conformed herself to the will of her watchful spouse for she knew his solicitude for the sacred tabernacle which was confided to his care and which was more holy and venerable than the holy of holies in the temple 
awaiting the time when her only begotten should be presented in the temple she was unremitting in her care of him lest she should forget anything necessary to protect him against the cold and the roughness of the weather she also prepared the cave for the arrival of the kings cleaning it once more and arranging it anew as far as the rudeness and destitution of the place allowed but her greatest attention and care was always reserved for the child itself bearing it in her arms continually until absolute necessity demanded otherwise besides all this she made use of her power as queen of all creation whenever the rigors of winter rose to excess for she commanded the frost and the winds the snow and the ice not to incommode their creator and to spend their elemental fury and asperity upon her person alone the heavenly queen gave her commands as follows restrain your wrath before your creator author lord and preserver who has called you into existence and given you strength and activity be mindful creatures of my beloved that you are furnished with rigor on account of sin for the chastisement of the disobedience of the first adam and his progeny but with the second adam who comes to repair this fall and cannot have any part therein you must be courteous reverencing and not offending him to whom you owe worship and subjection and therefore i command you in his name to cause no inconvenience or displeasure to him it is worthy of our admiration and imitation to notice the ready obedience of the irrational creatures to the divine will intimated to them by the mother of god for upon her command the snow and rain approached no nearer than ten yards the wind stopped short and the surrounding air retained a mild temperature to this miracle was added another one at the same time in which the divine infant in her arms received this homage of the elements and was protected from their asperity the virgin mother felt and suffered the cold and inclemency of the weather as if it were exerting all its natural influences in that place in this they obeyed the loving mother and sovereign mistress of creatures to the letter as she wished not to exempt herself from their asperity while she prevented her tender child and her god from suffering under it saint joseph enjoyed the same privilege as the sweet infant he noticed the favorable change of the temperature without knowing that it was due to the commands of his heavenly spouse and an effect of her power for she had not manifested to him this privilege because she had no command to that effect from the most high as to the order and manner in which the great queen nourished her child jesus it is to be remarked that she offered him her virginal milk three times a day and always with such reverence that she asked his permission beforehand and his pardon for the indignity considering herself and acknowledging herself unworthy of such a privilege many times while holding him in her arms she was on her knees adoring him and if at any time it was necessary to seat herself she always asked his permission with the same tokens of reverence she handed him to saint joseph and received him from his arms as i have said above many times she kissed his feet and when she wished to kiss his face she interiorly asked his benevolent consent the sweetest child returned these caresses of his mother not only by the expression of pleasure in his countenance which was at the same time full of majesty but also by other actions usual in children in him however they were accompanied by a serene deliberation the most ordinary token of his love was to recline sweetly upon the breast of the most pure mother or upon her shoulder encircling her neck with his divine arms these caresses the empress mary met with so much attention and discretion that she neither petulantly sought them as other mothers nor too timidly withdrew from them in all these things she behaved most perfectly and prudently without defect or excess of any kind the more openly and affectionately her most holy son manifested his love toward her so much the more deeply did she humiliate herself and so much the greater was her reverence in the same manner she gauged also the tokens of her affection and lent new glory to her magnanimity there was an interchange of caresses of another kind between the infant and his mother for besides understanding by divine enlightenment all the interior acts of the most holy soul of her only begotten as i have already stated it often happened that holding him in her arms she was privileged to see through his humanity as through a crystal casement 
thus perceiving the hypostatic union of the son of god with his human nature and witnessing the activity of his soul and interceding with the eternal father for the human race these operations and intercessions the heavenly lady faithfully imitated being entirely absorbed and transformed in her divine son his majesty on his part looked upon her with new accidental joy and delight regaling himself in the purity of this creature rejoicing that he had created her and that his becoming man had resulted in such a living image of his divinity and humanity in regard to this mystery the words of the soldiers of holofernes when they beheld the beauty of judith in the camp of bethulia occurred to me who can despise the people of the hebrews who have such beautiful women shall we not think it worth our while for their sakes to fight against them this saying seemed to be mysteriously realized in the incarnate word since he with greater cause could address them to his eternal father and to the rest of the creatures who shall fail to see that my coming from heaven and assuming flesh is fully justified since by coming upon the earth and dethroning the demon the world and the flesh and by conquering and vanquishing them such a woman is called into existence as is my mother among the children of adam o oh, sweetest love essence of my virtue life of my soul most loving jesus behold and see that most holy mary by herself possesses such immense beauty as exceeds that of all the human race she is the only and chosen one canticles chapter six verse eight so perfectly pleasing to thee my lord and my god that she not only equals but far surpasses all the rest of thy people and that she alone compensates god for all the wickedness of the race of adam so powerful were the effects of this delightful intercourse with her son and true god that she was more and more spiritualized and made godlike many times in these flights of her soul the force of her burning love would have torn asunder the ligaments of her members and destroyed the union of her soul and body if she had not been miraculously comforted and preserved she spoke to her most holy son secret words so exalted and full of weight that they cannot come within the range of our expression all that i can reproduce can never be anything more than a mere shadow of that which was manifested to me she said to him o oh, my love sweet love of my soul who art thou and who am i what dost thou wish to make of me by thus becoming man of man lowering thy greatness and magnificence in favour of such useless dust o oh, what shall thy slave do to pay the debt of love which she owes to thee what return shall i make for the great things which thou hast done to me psalm 115 verse 12 my being my life my faculties my feelings my desires and longings all is for thee comfort thy servant and thy mother in order that she may not fail in thy service at the sight of her own insignificance and in order that she may not die for love of thee oh how limited is the power of man how circumscribed his capacity how insufficient is human affection as it cannot sufficiently render a just return for thy love but the victory of mercy and magnificence must always be thine and to thee belong the triumphal songs of love while we must on the contrary always consider ourselves overcome and vanquished by thy power let us be humiliated and let us grovel in the dust while thy greatness is magnified and exalted in all the eternities the heavenly lady partaking of the science of her most holy son sometimes beheld the souls which in the course of the new law of grace were to distinguish themselves in divine love the works which they were to perform the martyrdom which they were to suffer in imitation of the lord in this knowledge she became so inflamed with love that her longings of love caused in her a greater martyrdom than those actually suffered by the saints to her happened what the spouse in the canticles mentions canticles chapter eight verse six that the emulations of love are as strong as death and hard as hell to these agonies of the loving mother caused by the mortal wounds of divine affection her most holy son answered in the words there used place me as a sign or seal in thy heart and upon thy arm causing in her at the same time the full understanding of these words as well as their actual fulfillment by this divine suffering most holy mary was a martyr above all other martyrs 
among such beds of lilies the meekest lamb jesus wandered while the day of grace began to break and the shades of the ancient law receded the divine child ate nothing during the time in which he was nourished at the virginal breast of his most holy mother for this milk was his only sustenance this was most sweet and substantial since it originated in a body so pure perfect and refined and one built up in exquisite harmony without any disorder or inequality no other body was equal to it in healthfulness and the sacred milk even if it would have been preserved a long time would have remained free from corruption by an especial privilege it never changed or soured though the milk of other women immediately degenerates and becomes corrupt as experience teaches the most fortunate joseph not only witnessed the favors and caresses which passed between the child and its mother but he himself shared in others which jesus deigned to confer upon him many times his heavenly spouse placed him in his arms this happened whenever she had to do some work during which she could not hold him herself as for instance when she prepared the meals or arranged the clothes of the infant or cleaned the house on these occasions saint joseph held him in his arms and he always felt divine effects in his soul the child jesus showed exterior signs of affection by his pleased looks by reclining upon his breast and by other tokens of affection usual with children in regard to their fathers but in him these tokens were always tempered with kingly majesty yet all this was not so frequent in his dealings with saint joseph nor with such endearment as with his true virgin mother whenever she left jesus in his care she received from saint joseph the relic of the circumcision which the latter ordinarily bore about with him for his consolation thus both the two spouses were continually enriched she by holding her most holy son he by his sacred blood and deified flesh they preserved it in a crystal vase which saint joseph had purchased with the money sent to them by saint elizabeth in this they had enclosed the particle of flesh and the sacred blood shed at the circumcision which had been caught up in pieces of linen the opening of the vase was encased in silver which the mighty queen in order to preserve the sacred relics more securely had sealed by her mere command thus the silver opening was more firmly sealed than if it had been soldered by the artisan who had made the vessel in this vase the prudent mother treasured the relics during her whole life and afterwards she entrusted it to the apostles leaving it as an inheritance to the holy church in this immense sea of mysteries i find myself so annihilated and dumbfounded by my ignorance as a woman and so narrowed in my powers of expression that i must leave much of it to be fathomed by the faith and piety of the christians instruction which the most holy queen mary gave me my daughter in the foregoing chapter thou hast been instructed not to seek information from the lord by supernatural means neither in order to relieve any suffering nor in order to satisfy a natural hankering of curiosity now i exhort thee likewise not to yield for any of these reasons to the desire of performing any exterior act according to the promptings of nature for in all the activity of thy exterior faculties and senses thou must seek to moderate and subject thy inclinations not yielding to them in their demands although they may have the color of virtue or piety i was in no danger of going to excess in these affections on account of my sinlessness nor was there a want of piety in my desire of remaining in the cave where my most holy son had been born and had been circumcised yet i did not wish to express my desire even when asked about it by my spouse for i preferred obedience to this pious inclination and i knew that it was more secure for the souls and more according to the pleasure of the lord to seek his will in the counsel and decision coming from another rather than in their own inclination in me this course of action was advisable only on account of the greater perfection contained therein but in thee and in other souls who are subject to error in their judgment this rule must be observed most rigorously so as to prevent and avoid mistakes diligently and discreetly for in their ignorance and pusillanimity men are easily carried away by their feelings and inclinations toward insignificant things and very often they occupy themselves with trifles as if they were important matters and with vanities as if they were realities all such activity weakens the soul and deprives it of great spiritual blessings 
of grace enlightenment and merit this doctrine shalt thou write in thy heart together with all the others which i am to give thee seek to use it as a reminder of all that i did so that as thou hast come to know it thou mayest also understand and execute it in thy life take notice of the reverence love and solicitude the holy and discreet fear with which i converse with my most holy son i always lived in this kind of watchfulness and even after i had conceived him in my womb i never lost it out of sight nor did the great love which he showed me diminish it in me in this ardent desire to please him my heart found no rest until it was entirely united and absorbed in the enjoyment of this my highest good and ultimate end excepting at certain times during which i rested in his love as in my soul joy i invariably carried about with me this continual solicitude like one who restlessly pursues his way and who permits himself not to be delayed by anything that is useless or hinders the attainment of his desired object so far was my heart from attaching itself to any earthly thing or from following the inclination of the senses that i lived as if i had not been composed of earthly substance if other creatures are not free from passions or do not overcome them as much as possible let them not blame nature but their own will on the contrary they justly incur the reproaches of weak nature because instead of governing and directing nature by the sovereign power of the will they make no use of that power they allow the natural inclinations to involve them in disorders abetting it by the free will and using their understanding to find still more dangerous occupations and occasions of ruin on account of these pitfalls presenting themselves in mortal life i warn thee my dearest not to hanker after or seek any of the visible things although they may appear to thee necessary and most appropriate for the circumstances use all things thy cell thy garments thy sustenance and whatever else of this life only in obedience and with the full consent of thy superiors because the lord requires this of thee and it is also my pleasure to see thee apply all things for the service of the omnipotent according to these great rules which i have given thee thou must regulate all thy activity end of chapter fifteen book two chapter sixteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter sixteen the three kings of the orient come to adore the word made man in bethlehem the three magi kings who came to find the divine infant after his birth were natives of persia arabia and saba psalm seventy one verse ten countries to the east of palestine their coming was prophesied especially by david and before him by balaam who having been hired by balak king of the moabites to curse the israelites blessed them instead numbers chapter twenty four verse seventeen in this blessing balaam said that he would see the king christ although not at once and that he would behold him although not present for he did not see him with his own eyes but through the magi his descendants many centuries after he said also that a star would arise unto jacob which was christ who arose to reign for ever in the house of jacob luke chapter one verse thirty two these three kings were well versed in the natural sciences and well read in the scriptures of the people of god and on account of their learning they were called magi by their knowledge of scripture and by conferring with some of the jews they were imbued with a belief in the coming of the messiah expected by that people they were moreover upright men truthful and very just in the government of their countries since their dominions were not so extended as those of our times they governed them easily and personally administered justice as wise and prudent sovereigns this is the true office of kings and therefore the holy ghost says that he holds their hearts in his hands in order to direct them like irrigated waters to the fulfillment of his holy will proverbs chapter twenty one verse one they were also of noble and magnanimous disposition free from avarice and covetousness 
which so oppresses degrades and belittles the spirits of princes because these magi governed adjoining countries and lived not far from each other they were mutual friends and shared with each other the virtues and knowledge which they had acquired consulting each other in the more important events of their reigns in all things they communicated with each other as most faithful friends i have already mentioned in the eleventh chapter that in the same night in which the incarnate word was born they were informed of his birth by the ministry of the holy angels it happened in the following manner one of the guardian angels of our queen of a higher order than that of the guardian angels of the three kings was sent from the cave of the nativity by his superior faculties he enlightened the three guardian angels of the kings informing them at the same time of the will and command of the lord that each of them should manifest to his charge the mystery of the incarnation and of the birth of christ our redeemer immediately and in the same hour each of these three angels spoke in dreams to the wise man under his care this is the usual course of angelic revelations when the lord communicates with souls through the angels this enlightenment of the kings concerning the mysteries of the incarnation was very copious and clear they were informed that the king of the jews was born as true god and man that he was the messiah and savior who was expected that it was the one who was promised in the scriptures and prophecies genesis chapter three verse ten and that they themselves the three kings were singled out by the lord to seek the star which balaam had foretold each one of the three kings also was made aware that the same revelation was being made to the other two in the same way and that it was not a favor or miracle which should remain unused but that they were expected to cooperate with the divine light and execute what it pointed out they were inspired and inflamed with a great love and with a desire to know the god made man to adore him as their creator and redeemer and serve him with most perfect devotion in all this they were greatly assisted by their distinguished moral virtues which they had acquired for on account of them they were excellently disposed for the operation of the divine enlightenment after receiving these heavenly revelations in their sleep the three kings awoke at the same hour of the night and prostrating themselves on the ground and humiliating themselves to the dust they adored in spirit the immutable being of god they exalted his infinite mercy and goodness for having sent the divine word to assume flesh of the virgin isaiah chapter seven verse fourteen in order to redeem the world and give eternal salvation to men then all three of them governed by an impulse of the same spirit resolved to depart without delay for judea in search of the divine child in order to adore him the three kings prepared gifts of gold incense and myrrh in equal quantities being guided by the same mysterious impulse and without having conferred with each other concerning their undertaking the three of them arrived at the same resolve and the same plan of executing it in order to set out immediately they procured on the same day the necessary camels and provisions together with a number of servants for the journey without heeding the commotion caused among their people or considering that they were to travel in foreign regions or caring for an outward show of authority without ascertaining particulars of the place whither they were to go or gathering information for identifying the child they resolved at once with fervent zeal and ardent love to depart in order to seek the new-born king at the same time the holy angel who had brought the news from bethlehem to the kings formed of the material air a resplendent star although not so large as those of the firmament for it was not to ascend higher than was necessary for the purpose of its formation it took its course through the atmospheric regions in order to guide and direct the holy kings to the cave where the child awaited them its splendor was of a different kind from that of the sun and the other stars with its most beautiful light it illumined the night like a brilliant torch and it mingled its own most active brilliancy with that of the sun by day on coming out of their palaces each one of the kings saw this new star matthew chapter two verse two although each from a different standpoint because it was only one star and it was placed in such a distance and height that it could be seen by each one at the same time 
as the three of them followed the guidance of this miraculous star they soon met thereupon it immediately approached them much more closely descending through many shifts of the aerial space and rejoicing them by shedding its refulgence over them at closer range they began to confer among themselves about the revelation they had received and about their plans finding that they were identical they were more and more inflamed with devotion and with the pious desire of adoring the new-born god and broke out in praise and admiration at the inscrutable works and mysteries of the almighty the magi pursued their journey under the guidance of the star without losing sight of it until they arrived at jerusalem as well on this account as also because this city was the capital and metropolis of the jews they suspected that this was the birthplace of their legitimate and true king they entered into the city and openly inquired after him saying matthew chapter two verse eight where is the king of the jews who is born for we have seen his star in the east announcing to us his birth and we have come to see him and adore him their inquiry came to the ears of herod who at that time unjustly reigned in judah and lived in jerusalem the wicked king panic-stricken at the thought that a more legitimate claimant to the throne should have been born felt much disturbed and outraged by this report with him the whole city was aroused some of the people out of flattery to the king others on account of the fear of disturbance immediately as saint matthew relates herod called together a meeting of the principal priests and scribes in order to ask them where christ was to be born according to the prophecies and holy scriptures they answered that according to the words of one of the prophets micaeus micah chapter five verse two he was to be born in bethlehem since it was written by him that thence the ruler of israel was to arise thus informed of the birthplace of the new king of israel and insidiously plotting from that very moment to destroy him herod dismissed the priests then he secretly called the magi in order to learn of them at what time they had seen the star as harbinger of his birth matthew chapter two verse seven they ingenuously informed him and he sent them away to bethlehem saying to them in covert malice go and inquire after the infant and when you have found him announce it to me in order that i too may go to recognize and adore him the magi departed leaving the hypocritical king ill at ease and in great consternation at such indisputable signs of the coming of the legitimate king of israel into the world although he could have eased his mind in regard to his sovereignty by the thought that a recently born infant could not be enthroned so very soon yet human prosperity is so unstable and deceitful that it can be overthrown even by an infant or by the mere threat of far-off danger thus can even an imagined uncertainty destroy all the enjoyment and happiness so deceitfully offered to its possessors on leaving jerusalem the magi again found the star which at their entrance they had lost from view by its light they were conducted to bethlehem and to the cave of the nativity diminishing in size it hovered over the head of the infant jesus and bathed him in its light whereupon the matter of which it had been composed dissolved and disappeared our great queen had already been prepared by the lord for the coming of the kings and when she understood that they were approaching the cave she requested saint joseph not to leave it but to stay at her side this he did although the sacred text does not mention it like many other things passed over in the gospels this was not necessary for establishing the truth of the mystery nevertheless it is certain that saint joseph was present when the kings adored the infant jesus the precaution of sending him away was not necessary for the magi had already been instructed that the mother of the newborn was a virgin and that he was the true god and not the son of saint joseph nor would god have permitted them to be led to the cave ignorant of such an important circumstance as his origin allowing them to adore the child as the son of joseph and of a mother not a virgin they were fully instructed as to all these things and they were deeply impressed by the sacramental character of all these exalted and complicated mysteries the heavenly mother awaited the pious and devout kings standing with the child in her arms 
amid the humble and poor surroundings of the cave in incomparable modesty and beauty she exhibited at the same time a majesty more than human the light of heaven shining in her countenance still more visible was this light in the child shedding through the cavern effulgent splendor which made it like a heaven the three kings of the east entered and at the first sight of the son and mother they were for a considerable space of time overwhelmed with wonder they prostrated themselves upon the earth and in this position they worshipped and adored the infant acknowledging him as the true god and man and as the savior of the human race by the divine power which the sight of him and his presence exerted in their souls they were filled with a new enlightenment they perceived the multitude of angelic spirits who as servants and ministers of the king of kings and the lord of lords attended upon him in reverential fear hebrews chapter one verse four arising they congratulated their and our queen as mother of the son of the eternal father and they approached to reverence her on their knees they sought her hand in order to kiss it as they were accustomed to do to their queens in their countries but the most prudent lady withdrew her hand and offering instead that of the redeemer of the world saying my spirit rejoices in the lord and my soul blesses and extols him because among all the nations he has called and selected you to look upon and behold that which many kings and prophets have in vain desired to see namely him who is the eternal word incarnate luke chapter 10 verse 24 let us extol and praise his name on account of the sacraments and mysteries wrought among his people let us kiss the earth which he sanctifies by his real presence at these words of the most holy mary the three kings humiliated themselves anew adoring the infant jesus they acknowledged the great blessing of living in the time when the sun of justice was arising in order to illumine the darkness malachi chapter four verse two thereupon they spoke to saint joseph congratulating him and extolling his good fortune in being chosen as the spouse of the mother of god and they expressed their wonder and compassion at the great poverty beneath which were hidden the greatest mysteries of heaven and earth in this intercourse they consumed three hours and then the kings asked permission of most holy mary to go to the city in order to seek a lodging as they could find no room for themselves in the cave some people had accompanied them but the magi alone participated in the light and the grace of this visit the others took notice merely of what passed exteriorly and witnessed only the destitute and neglected condition of the mother and her husband though wondering at the strange event they perceived nothing of its mystery the magi took leave and departed while most holy mary and joseph being again alone with their child glorified his majesty with new songs of praise because his name was beginning to be known and adored among the gentiles psalm eighty five verse nine what else the three wise men did will be related in the following chapter instruction which the queen of heaven gave me my daughter the events recorded in this chapter contain much for the instruction of kings and princes and for the other faithful as for instance the prompt obedience and humility of the magi which men should imitate and the obdurate wickedness of herod which they are to fear and abhor for each reap the fruit of his actions the kings reap the fruit of justice and other virtues which they practised while herod reaped those of ambition and pride by which he had usurped the government and of other vices into which he cast himself without restriction or moderation but let this remark together with the other teachings of the holy church suffice for those that live in the world to thyself must thou apply the doctrine contained in what thou hast written always remembering that all the perfection of a christian life must be founded upon the catholic truths and in the constant and firm acknowledgment of them as they are taught by holy faith in order to impress them upon thy heart thou must profit of all that thou readest or hearest of the divine writings and of what is contained in other devout and instructive books concerning the virtues thy faith thou must accompany by the practice and abundance of all good works hoping ever in the visitation and coming of the most high letter to titus chapter two verse thirteen 
by such a disposition thy soul will be prepared in the manner i require of thee for i desire that the almighty find in thee the sweet readiness to adopt whatever is manifested to thee and to put in practice whatever may be enjoined without any human respect i promise that if thou follow my counsel as thou shouldest i will be thy star and guide on the ways of the lord so that thou wilt quickly arrive at the vision and enjoyment of thy god and of thy highest good in sion psalm eighty three verse eight in this doctrine and in what happened to the devout kings of the orient there is contained a most effective means for the salvation of souls yet this is known to few and heeded by a still smaller number of men it is this that the inspirations and enlightenments are usually sent by god to creatures in a certain order at first some are sent to incite the soul to practice some of the virtues if the soul corresponds the most high sends other and greater ones in order to move the soul to greater perfection in virtue and thus profiting from previous graces the soul is disposed for still others receiving ever greater helps and securing an increase of the favors of the lord according as it corresponds to them thou wilt therefore understand two things first how great a damage it is to neglect the practice of any virtue and not to practice perfection according to the dictates of the divine inspirations secondly how often god would give great assistance to the souls if they would begin to correspond to the smaller ones since he is as it were in expectation and hope that they will prepare for his greater ones apocalypse chapter six verse twenty for he wishes to deal with the soul according to his just judgments but because they overlook this orderly manner of proceeding in his invitations he suspends the flow of his divine gifts and he refuses to the souls what was intended for them if they had not placed an obstacle allowing them to fall from one abyss to the other psalm forty one verse eight the magi and herod pursued opposite courses the magi met the first inspirations and graces by the practice of the good works thus they disposed themselves by many virtues for being called and drawn by divine revelation to the knowledge of the mysteries of the incarnation the birth of the divine word and the redemption of the human race and through this to the happiness and perfection of the way of life but herod on the other hand by his hard-heartedness and neglect of the helps which god offered him for the practice of virtue was drawn into the abyss of his measureless pride and ambition these vices hurled him into such vast precipices of cruelty as to be the first one among men to seek the life of the redeemer of the world under the cloak of simulated devotion and piety in giving vent to his furious rage he took away the life of the innocent children and attempted by so foul a measure to advance his damned and perverse undertaking End of chapter sixteen book two chapter seventeen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter seventeen the magi kings return once more to see and adore the infant jesus they offer their gifts on taking leave and return by a different route to their homes from the grotto of the nativity into which the three kings had entered directly on their way to jerusalem they betook themselves to a lodging inside of the town of bethlehem they retired to a room where in an abundance of affectionate tears and aspirations they spent the greater part of the night speaking of what they had seen of the feelings and affections aroused in each and of what each had noticed for himself in the divine child and his mother during this conference they were more and more inflamed with divine love amazed at the majesty and divine effulgence of the infant jesus at the prudence modesty and reserve of his mother at the holiness of her spouse joseph and the poverty of all three at the humbleness of the place where the lord of heaven and earth had wished to be born the devout kings felt a divine fire which flamed up in their hearts and not being able to restrain themselves they broke out into exclamations of sweet affection and acts of great reverence and love what is this that we feel they said 
what influence of this great king is it that moves us to such desires and affections after this how shall we converse with men what can we do who have been instructed in such new hidden and supernatural mysteries o greatness of his omnipotence unknown to men and concealed beneath so much poverty o humility unimaginable for mortals would that all be drawn to it in order that they may not be deprived of such happiness during these divine colloquies the magi remembered the dire destitution of jesus mary and joseph in their cave and they resolved immediately to send them some gifts in order to show their affection and to satisfy their desire of serving them since they could not do anything else for them they sent through their servants many of the gifts which they had already set aside for them and others which they could procure most holy mary and joseph received these gifts with humble acknowledgment and they made a return not of empty worded thanks as other men are apt to make but many efficacious blessings for the spiritual consolation of the three kings these gifts enabled our great queen to prepare for her ordinary guests the poor an abundant repast for the needy ones were accustomed to receive alms from her and attracted still more by her sweet words were wont to come and visit her the kings went to rest full of incomparable joy in the lord and in their sleep the angels advised them as to their journey homeward on the following day at dawn they returned to the cave of the nativity in order to offer to the heavenly king the special gifts which they had provided arriving they prostrated themselves anew in profound humility and opening their treasures as scripture relates they offered him gold incense and myrrh matthew chapter two verse eleven they consulted the heavenly mother in regard to many mysteries and practices of faith and concerning matters pertaining to their consciences and to the government of their countries for they wished to return well instructed and capable of directing themselves to holiness and perfection in their daily life the great lady heard them with exceeding pleasure and she conferred interiorly with the divine infant concerning all that they had asked in order to answer and properly to instruct these sons of the new law as a teacher and an instrument of divine wisdom she answered all their questions giving them such high precepts of sanctity that they could scarcely part from her on account of the sweetness and attraction of her words however an angel of the lord appeared to them reminding them of the necessity and of the will of the lord that they should return to their country no wonder that her words should so deeply affect these kings for all her words were inspired by the holy spirit and full of infused science regarding all that they had inquired and many other matters the heavenly mother received the gifts of the kings and in their name offered them to the infant jesus his majesty showed by signs of highest pleasure that he accepted their gifts they themselves became aware of the exalted and heavenly blessings which he repaid them more than a hundredfold matthew chapter nineteen verse twenty nine according to the custom of their country they also offered to the heavenly princess some gems of great value but because these gifts had no mysterious signification and referred not to jesus she returned them to the kings reserving only the gifts of gold incense and myrrh in order to send them away more rejoiced she gave them some of the clothes in which she had wrapped the infant god for she neither had nor could have had any greater visible pledges of esteem with which to enrich them at their departure the three kings received these relics with such reverence and esteem that they encased them in gold and precious stones in order to keep them ever after as a proof of their value these relics spread about such a copious fragrance that they revealed their presence a league in circumference however only those who believed in the coming of god into the world were able to perceive it while the incredulous perceived none of the fragrance emitted by the relics in their own countries the magi performed great miracles with these relics the holy kings also offered their property and possession to the mother of the sweetest jesus or if she did not wish to accept of them and preferred to live in this place where her most holy son had been born they would build her a house wherein she could live more comfortably the most prudent mother thanked them for their offers without accepting them 
on taking leave of her the three kings besought her from their inmost hearts not to forget them which she promised and fulfilled in the same way they spoke to saint joseph with the blessing of jesus mary and joseph they departed so moved by tenderest affection that it seemed to them that they had left their hearts all melted into sighs and tears in that place they chose another way for their return journey in order not to meet herod in jerusalem for thus they had been instructed by the angel on the preceding night on their departure from bethlehem the same or a similar star appeared in order to guide them home conducting them on their new route to the place where they had first met whence each one separated to reach his own country for the rest of their lives these most fortunate kings lived up to their divine vocations as true disciples of the mistress of holiness governing both their souls and the people of their states according to her teaching by the example of their lives and the knowledge of the messias which they spread about they converted a great number of souls to the belief in the true god and to the way of salvation finally full of days and merits they closed their careers in sanctity and justice having been favored both in life and in death by the mother of mercy after dismissing the kings the heavenly queen and saint joseph spent their time in new canticles of praise of the wonders of the most high conferring them with the sayings of the scriptures and the prophecies of the patriarchs which they saw fulfilled one after another in the infant jesus but the most prudent mother who profoundly penetrated into the deepest meaning of these high sacraments remembered them all and treasured them up in her bosom luke chapter two verse nineteen the holy angels who were witnesses of these holy mysteries congratulated their queen that her most holy son had been manifested and that his majesty had been adored by men and they sang to him new canticles magnifying his mercies wrought upon mankind instruction which the queen of heaven gave me my daughter great were the gifts which the kings offered to my most holy son but greater still was the affection with which they offered them and the mystery concealed beneath them on account of all this they were most acceptable to his majesty i wish that thou also offer up similar gifts thanking him for having made thee poor in condition and profession for i assure thee my dearest there is no more acceptable gift to the most high than voluntary poverty there are very few in the world in our days who use well the temporal riches and offer them to their god and lord with the generosity and love of these holy kings the poor of the lord so numerous in our day experience and give witness how cruel and avaricious human nature has become since in their great necessities they are so little succored by the rich this gross uncharitableness of men offends the holy angels and grieves the holy ghost since they are bound to witness the nobility of the souls so degraded and abased in the service of vile greed of gold with all its evil powers ecclesiastes chapter ten verse twenty as if all things had been created for the individual use of the rich they appropriate them to themselves and deprive the poor their brothers springing from the same nature and flesh and denying them even to god who created and preserves all things and who can give or take at will it is most lamentable that while the rich might purchase eternal life with their possessions they abuse them to draw upon themselves damnation as senseless and foolish creatures luke chapter sixteen verse nine this evil is common among the children of adam and therefore voluntary poverty is so excellent and safe a remedy by it making men willing to part joyfully with his possessions for the sake of the poor a great sacrifice is offered to the lord thou also canst make such an offering of the things necessary for sustenance giving a part of it to the poor and desiring if it were possible by thy labor and sweat to help them all thy ceaseless offer however must be love which is the gold continual prayer which is the incense and the patient acceptance of labor and true mortifications which is the myrrh all that thou dost for the lord thou should offer up to him with fervent affection and promptitude without negligence or fear for negligent works and those not enlivened by love are not an acceptable sacrifice in the eyes of his majesty 
in order to make those incessant offerings it is necessary that divine faith and light continually inflame thy heart having before thy eyes the great object of thy praise and exaltation and the stimulus of love by which thou art bound to the right hand of the most high thus shouldest thou continue incessantly in this sweet exercise of love so proper to the spouses of his majesty for their name implies such a continual payment of the debt of love and affection end of chapter seventeen book two chapter eighteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter eighteen the most holy mary and joseph distribute the gifts received from the magi and they remain in bethlehem until their departure for the presentation of the infant jesus in the temple after the departure of the three kings and after the due celebration of the great mystery of the adoration of the infant jesus there was really nothing to wait for in that poor yet sacred place and they were free to leave it the most prudent mother then said to saint joseph my master and spouse the offerings which the kings have made to our god and child must not remain here idle they must be applied to the service of his majesty and should be used according to his will and pleasure i deserve nothing even of temporal goods dispose of all these gifts as belonging to my son and to thee the most faithful of husbands answered with his accustomed humility and courtesy that he would leave all to her and would be pleased to see her dispose of them but her majesty insisted anew and said since thou makest an excuse of humility my master do it then for love of the poor who are waiting for their share they have a right to the things which their heavenly father has created for their sustenance they therefore immediately concluded to divide the gifts into three parts one destined for the temple of jerusalem namely the incense and myrrh as well as part of the gold another part as offering to the priest who had circumcised the child in order that he might use it for himself and for the synagogue or oratory in bethlehem and the third part for distribution among the poor this resolve they executed with generous and fervent affection the almighty made use of a poor but honorable and pious woman to be the occasion of their leaving the cave she had come a few times to visit our queen for the house in which she lived was built up against the wall of the city not far from the cave some time later this devout woman not being aware of what had happened but having heard the rumor of the king's coming held a conversation with most holy mary and asked her whether she had heard that some wise men who were said to be kings had come from afar seeking the messiahs the heavenly princess aware of the good disposition of this woman took occasion to instruct her and catechize her in the common belief without revealing to her the hidden sacrament connected with herself and the sweetest child whom she held in her arms tobit chapter twelve verse seven in order to relieve her poverty she gave her some of the gold destined for the poor thereby the condition of this fortunate woman was much improved and she became attached with heart and soul to her teacher and benefactress she invited the holy family to live in her house and as it was a poor one it was so much the more accommodated to the founders and builders of holy poverty the poor woman pleaded with great persistence as she saw the great inconvenience to which the most holy mary and joseph with the child were subject in the cave the queen did not refuse her offer and answered that she would let her know of her decision mary and saint joseph conferred with each other and they resolved to leave the cave and lodge in the house of this woman awaiting there the time of the purification and the presentation in the temple they did it so much the more willingly as it afforded them a chance to remain near the cave of the nativity and also because many people began to frequent the cave on account of the rumor of the visit of the kings which had been spread about on account of these and other considerations most holy mary with saint joseph and the sacred child took leave of the cave although with tenderest regret they accepted the hospitality of that fortunate woman who received them with the greatest charity and assigned to them the larger portion of her dwelling the holy angels and ministers of the most high accompanied them in human forms which they had always retained 
whenever the heavenly mother and saint joseph her spouse piously revisited the memorable spots of the sanctuary they came and went with them as numerous courtiers delegated to their service moreover when the child and his mother took leave of the cave god appointed an angel as its keeper and watcher as he had done with the garden of paradise genesis chapter three verse twenty four and this guard remained and does remain to this day sword in hand at the opening of the cave and never since then has an animal entered there that this holy angel does not hinder the entrance of hostile infidels in whose possession this and the other holy places are is because of the judgments of the most high who allows men to execute the designs of his wisdom and justice this permission would not be necessary if christian princes were filled with fervent zeal for the honor and glory of christ and would seek the restoration of these holy places consecrated by the blood and the labors of the lord and of his most holy mother and by the works of our redemption and even if this would not be possible there is no excuse for not attending with faithful diligence to the decent keeping of the mysterious places since nothing is impossible to the believer who can overcome the mountains matthew chapter seventeen verse nineteen i was given to understand that the pious devotion and veneration for the holy land is one of the most powerful and efficacious means for establishing and confirming catholic monarchies and no one can deny that many of their excessive and unnecessary expenses could be avoided by employing their resources in such a pious enterprise which would be pleasing both to god and to men for in making such an honest use of their incomes there is no need of outward justification the most pure mary and her spouse having with her divine child moved to the dwelling in the vicinity of the cave remained there until according to the requirements of the law she was to be present herself with her firstborn for purification in the temple for this mystery the most holy of creatures resolved to dispose herself worthily by a fervent desire of carrying the infant jesus as an offering to the eternal father in his temple by imitating her son and by seeking the adornment and beauty of great virtues as a worthy offering and victim for the most high with this intention the heavenly lady during the days which still remained until her purification performed such heroic acts of love and of all other virtues that neither the tongue of angels nor of men can explain them how much less can this then be done by a useless and entirely ignorant woman by sincere piety and devotion the christians who dispose themselves by reverent contemplation will merit to feel these mysteries judging of the more intelligible favors received by the virgin mother they can surmise and imagine the others which do not fall within the scope of human words from his very birth the infant jesus spoke to his sweetest mother in audible words for immediately after his birth as mentioned in chapter the tenth he said to her imitate me my spouse make thyself like unto me this is when they were alone and although he always spoke to her most plainly saint joseph never heard his words until the child was one year of age when he also spoke to him nor did the heavenly lady reveal this secret for she understood that it was only for her the conversations of the infant god were such as were worthy of the greatness of his majesty and his infinite power such as were befitting the most pure and holy the most wise and prudent of all creatures next to himself and one who was his true mother sometimes he said my dove my chosen one my dearest mother canticles chapter two verse ten in such caressing words as were contained in the canticles and other continual interior intercourse the most holy son and mother passed their time and in these the heavenly princess received favors and was delighted by caresses so sweet and loving as exceed those of the canticles of solomon and greater one than all the just and holy souls enjoyed from the beginning to the end of the world many times during these mysteries of his love the infant jesus repeated these words already mentioned make thyself like unto me my mother and my dove as they were words of life and infinite power and as most holy mary at the same time was furnished with the infused knowledge of all the interior operations of the soul of her only begotten no tongue can declare nor thought can comprehend 
the effects wrought in the most candid and inflamed heart of this mother of the god-man among the more rare and excellent privileges of most pure mary the chief one is that she is mother of god which is the foundation of all the rest the second is that she was conceived without sin the third that she enjoyed many times the beatific vision in this mortal life and the fourth is that she continually saw clearly the most holy soul of her son and all its operations for her imitation she had it present to her eyes as a most clear and pure mirror in which she could behold herself again and again in order to adorn herself with most precious gems of virtue made in imitation of those seen in that most holy soul there she saw it united with the divine word and she exercised her humility in seeing how much her own human nature was inferior to that of christ she perceived with the clearest insight the acts of gratitude and praise with which the soul of christ praised the almighty for having been created out of nothing as the rest of the souls and for the graces and gifts with which it was endowed above others as a creature and especially for having been elevated and made godlike by the union of the human nature with the divinity she pondered over his petitions prayers and supplications to his eternal father for the human race and how in all his other activity he prepared himself for its redemption and instruction as the sole redeemer and teacher of man for eternal life all these works of the most holy humanity of christ our supreme good his most pure mother continually sought to imitate there is much to say concerning this great mystery of her imitation in this history for she had this example and model incessantly before her eyes and according to it she regulated her own activity and behavior during the incarnation and nativity of her son like a busy bee she continually built up the sweetest honeycomb of delights for the incarnate word his majesty having come from heaven as our redeemer and teacher wished that his most holy mother of whom he had formed his human existence should participate in a most exalted and singular manner in the fruits of the common redemption and that she should be the chosen and selected disciple in whom his teaching should be vividly stamped and whom he wished to make as similar to himself as possible in the light of these intentions and blessed purposes of the incarnate word we must judge of the greatness of mary's deeds and of the delights which he enjoyed while resting upon her arms and reclining upon her breast for it was indeed the bridal chamber and the couch of this the true spouse canticles chapter one verse fifteen during the days in which the most holy queen tarried near bethlehem before the purification some of the people came to see and speak with her but almost all of them were of the poorest class some of them came because of the alms which she distributed others because they had heard of the kings who had visited the cave all of them spoke of this visit and of the coming of the redeemer for in those days not without divine predisposal the belief that the birth of the messiah was at hand was very widespread among the jews and the talk about it was very frequent this gave the most prudent mother repeated occasion to exercise herself in magnanimous works not only by guarding the secret of her bosom and by conferring within herself about all that she saw and heard but also by directing many souls toward the knowledge of god by confirming them in the faith instructing them in the practice of virtues enlightening them in the mysteries of the messiahs whom they were expecting and dispelling the ignorance in which they were cast as a low-minded people little versed in the things of god sometimes their talk about these matters was so full of error and womanish prattle that the simple saint joseph smiled in secret he wondered at the heavenly wisdom and force of the answers with which the great lady met their gossip and instructed them at her patience and gentleness in leading them to the truth and to the perception of the light at her profound humility and yet patient reserve with which she knew how to dismiss all of them consoled rejoiced and furnished with all that was good for them to know she spoke to them words of eternal life which penetrated inflamed and strengthened their hearts john chapter six verse sixty nine instruction which the most holy mary our queen gave me my daughter by the divine light i knew better than all other creatures at what a low value the most high esteems earthly blessings and riches 
therefore in my holy liberty of spirit i felt myself troubled and inconvenienced by the possession of the treasures of the kings offered to my most holy son as in all my deeds i was to shine in humility and obedience i did not wish to appropriate them to myself nor dispose of them according to my own will but according to the wishes of my spouse joseph in this resignation i managed to act as if i were his handmaid and as if none of these gifts concerned me in any way for it is debasing and for you weak creatures very dangerous to appropriate or attribute any of the goods of the earth be they of material possessions or goods of honour for all this cannot be done without covetousness ambition and vain ostentation i wish to tell thee all this my dearest in order that thou mayest know how to refuse riches or honour as due to thee and not appropriate to thyself any of them especially not if thou receive them from persons of influence and exalted station preserve thy interior liberty and make no show of a thing which is worth nothing and which cannot justify thee before god if anything is brought to thee never say this is given to me or is presented to me but this the lord sends to our convent pray to god for those whom his majesty has sent as the instruments of his mercies and mention the name of the giver in order that they may pray particularly for him and that he may not be disappointed in the purpose of his gift also do not receive it personally lest you raise a suspicion of covetousness but let those appointed to this duty receive it and if in thy office as superior thou must make distribution of things within the convent let it be with detachment and without any show of personal rights of possession in them yet at the same time as one who knows that she does not deserve any favors do not forget to thank the most high and the giver that which is brought to the other religious thou must acknowledge thankfully as the superior and immediately see that thou apply it for the community without reserving any part of it for thy own use do not inquire curiously about the incomes of the convent in order that thou mayest not take a sensible pleasure therein and that thou mayest not seek delight in the reception of such favors for frail and passionate nature incurs many defects in such a transaction and of few of the defects does it render much account to itself nothing can be trusted to infected human nature for it always seeks after more than it possesses and it never says enough and the more it receives the greater thirst it has for more but it is to the intimate and frequent intercourse with the lord by unceasing love praise and reverence that i wish thee to attend most of all in this i wish my daughter that thou work with all thy strength and that thou apply thy faculties and powers incessantly with great watchfulness and care for without this the inferior parts will inevitably weigh down thy soul derange and upset it divert and cast it down causing it to lose the vision of the highest good wisdom chapter nine verse fifteen this loving intercourse of the lord is so delicate that even by listening or attending to the deceits of the enemy the soul loses it on this account the enemy makes great efforts to draw thy attention toward himself knowing that the punishment of listening to him will be the concealment of the object of its love from the soul canticles chapter five verse six as soon as it carelessly ignores the beauty of the lord it enters upon the byways of neglect and is deprived of the divine sweetness canticles chapter one verse seven when afterwards the soul having with sorrow experienced the evils of such inadvertence wishes to return to seek him it does not always find or recover him canticles chapter three verses one and two as the demon who deceived it then presents other delights so vile and unlike those to which the soul has been accustomed interiorly new cause of sadness disturbance dejection lukewarmness and dissatisfaction arises and its whole interior is filled with dangerous confusion of this truth my dearest thou thyself hast some experience wherein thou couldst notice the effects of neglect and tardiness in believing the favours of the lord it is time that thou be prudent in thy sincerity and constant in keeping up the fire of the sanctuary leviticus chapter six verse twelve without ever losing sight for a moment of that same object 
which I attend to with all the powers of my soul and all my faculties, although the distance between thy conduct, that of a mere wormlet, and that which I propose for thy imitation is great, and although thou canst not enjoy the supreme good so unreservedly as I, nor live in the same condition as I, yet since I instruct thee, and show thee, what I did to assimilate myself to my most holy Son, thou canst imitate me according to thy strength, using my doings as a mirror. I saw him in the mirror of his humanity, thou in my soul and person. If the Almighty calls and invites all men to the highest perfection by following him, consider what thou art obliged to do, since thou hast been drawn toward the Most High by such a generous and powerful influence of his right hand. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 Canticles chapter 1 verse 3 End of chapter 18book two chapter nineteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter nineteen most holy mary and joseph depart with the infant jesus in order to fulfill the law by presenting him in the temple of jerusalem already the forty days after the birth of a son during which a woman according to the law was considered unclean and during which she was obliged to continue her purification for her readmittance into the temple was coming to a close leviticus chapter twenty two verse four in order to comply with this law and satisfy another obligation contained in exodus chapter thirteenth which demanded the sanctification and presentation to the lord of all the firstborn sons the mother of all purity prepared to go to jerusalem where she was to appear in the temple with her son as the only begotten of the eternal father and purify herself according to the custom of other women she had no doubts about complying with that part of the law which applied to herself in common with other mothers not that she was ignorant of her innocence and purity for ever since the incarnation of the word she knew of her exemption from actual sin and from the stain of original sin nor was she ignorant of the fact that she had conceived by the holy ghost and brought forth without labor remaining a virgin more pure than the sun luke chapter one verse fifteen yet she hesitated not to subject herself to the common law on the contrary in the ardent longing of her heart after humiliation and annihilation to the dust she desired to do this of her own free will in regard to the presentation of her most holy son there was some occasion for the same doubt as in regard to the circumcision for she knew him to be the true god superior to the laws which he himself had made but she was informed of the will of the lord by divine light and by the interior acts of the most holy soul of the incarnate word for she saw his desire of sacrificing himself and offering himself as a living victim letter to the ephesians chapter five verse two to the eternal father in thanksgiving for having formed his most pure body and created his most holy soul for having destined him as an acceptable sacrifice for the human race and for the welfare of mortals these acts of the most sacred humanity of the word were continual conforming himself to the divine will not only in so far as he was already beatified but also in so far as he was still a wayfarer upon earth and our redeemer yet in addition to these interior acts and in obedience to the law he wished to be offered to the eternal father in the temple where all adored and magnified him as in a house of prayer expiation and sacrifice deuteronomy chapter twelve verse five the great lady conferred about the journey with her husband and having resolved to be in jerusalem on the very day appointed by the law and having made the necessary preparations they took leave of the good woman who had so devotedly entertained them although this woman was left in ignorance of the divine mysteries connected with her guests she was filled with the blessings of heaven which brought her abundant fruit mary and joseph betook themselves to the cave of the nativity not wishing to begin their journey without once more venerating that sanctuary so humble and yet so rich in happiness though at that time this was yet unknown to the world 
the mother handed the child jesus to saint joseph in order to prostrate herself and worship the earth which had been witness to such venerable mysteries having done this with incomparable devotion and tenderness she said to her husband my master give me thy benediction for this journey as thou art wont to do at departing from home i beseech thee also to allow me to perform this journey on foot and unshod since i am to bear in my arms the victim which is to be offered to the eternal father this is a mysterious work and as far as it is possible i wish to perform it with due reverence and ceremony our queen was accustomed for the sake of modesty to wear shoes which covered her feet and served as a sort of stocking they were made of a certain plant used by the poor and something like hemp or mallow dried and woven into a coarse and strong texture which though poor was yet cleanly and appropriate saint joseph told her to arise for she was kneeling before him and said may the most high son of the eternal father whom i hold in my arms give thee his blessing as for the rest it is well and good that thou journey afoot in bringing him to jerusalem but thou must not go barefoot because the weather does not permit it and thy desire will be accepted by the lord instead of the deed thus saint joseph in order not to deprive most holy mary of the joy of humiliation and obedience made use of his authority as husband although with great reverence and as saint joseph only obeyed her and humiliated and mortified himself in commanding her it happened that both of them exercised humility and obedience reciprocally that he refused her permission to go barefoot to jerusalem was occasioned by his apprehensions lest the cold should injure her health for though he did not know the wonderful qualities and composition of her virginal and perfect body nor the other privileges conferred upon her by the divine right hand the obedient queen made no reply to the orders of her husband and obeyed his wish not to go unshod in order to again receive in her arms the infant jesus she prostrated herself on the earth thanking him and adoring him for the blessings which he had wrought for them and for the whole human race in that cave she besought his majesty that this sanctuary be held in esteem and reverence by the catholics and that it remain in their possession and she again placed it in charge of the holy angel who had been set as its guardian she covered herself with a cloak for the journey and receiving in her arms jesus the treasurer of heaven she pressed him to her breast tenderly shielding him from the inclemency of the wintry weather they departed from the cave asking the blessing of the infant god which his majesty gave them in a visible manner saint joseph placed upon the ass the chest containing the clothes of the infant and the gifts of the kings destined for their temple offering thus began the most solemn procession which was ever held from bethlehem to the temple in jerusalem for in company with the prince of the eternities jesus the queen his mother and saint joseph her spouse journeyed the ten thousand angels that had assisted at these mysteries and the other legions that had brought from heaven the sweet and holy name of jesus at the circumcision all these heavenly courtiers passed along in visible human forms so beautiful and shining that in comparison with them all that is delightful or precious in the world is less than dirt or mud compared to the finest and purest gold and in their splendor they obliterated the sun in its brightest light and would have turned night into the brightest day the heavenly queen and saint joseph rejoiced in their effulgence while all of them together exalted these mysteries by new canticles of praise in honor of the divine child about to be presented in the temple in this fashion they journeyed the two leagues from bethlehem to jerusalem on this occasion not without divine dispensation the weather was unusually severe so that without regard for the tender child its creator the cold and sleety blasts pierced to his shivering limbs and caused the divine infant to weep as it rested in the arms of his loving mother being however moved thereto more by his compassion and love for men than by the effects of the inclemency of the weather upon his body the mighty empress turned to the winds and elements and as mistress of creation reprehended them with indignation that they should thus persecute their maker she commanded them to moderate their rigor toward the child but not toward her the elements obeyed the commands of their true and rightful mistress the cold blasts were changed into a soft and balmy air for the infant without diminishing their inclemency toward the mother thus she herself felt it but not her infant 
as on other occasions already mentioned and yet to be mentioned she addressed also sin which she had not contracted and said o oh, sin how most disorderly and inhuman art thou since in order to satisfy for thee the creator of all things is afflicted by the very creatures which he has made and preserves in being thou art a terrible and horrible monster offensive to god and destructive of creatures thou turnest them into abominations and deprivest them of their greatest happiness that of being friends of god o oh, children of men how long will you be so heavy-hearted as to love vanity and deceit be not so ungrateful toward the most high and so cruel to yourselves open your eyes and recognize your dangers do not despise the precepts of your eternal father and do not forget the teachings of your mother who has brought you forth by charity for since the only begotten of the father has assumed flesh in my womb he has made me the mother of all creation as such i love you and if it were possible and according to the will of the most high that i suffer all the punishments visited upon you from the time of adam until now i would accept them with pleasure during the journey of our lady with the infant god it happened in jerusalem that simeon the high priest was enlightened by the holy ghost concerning the coming of the incarnate word and his presentation in the temple in the arms of his mother the same revelation was given to the holy widow anne and she was also informed of the poverty and suffering of saint joseph and the most pure lady on their way to jerusalem these two holy persons immediately conferring with each other about their revelations and enlightenments called the chief procurator of the temporal affairs of the temple and describing to him the signs whereby he should recognize the holy travellers they ordered him to proceed to the gate leading out to bethlehem and receive them into his house with all benevolence and hospitality this the procurator did and thus the queen and her spouse were much relieved since they had been anxious about finding a proper lodging for the divine infant leaving them well provided in his house the fortunate host returned in order to report to the high priest on that evening before they retired most holy mary and joseph conferred with each other about what they were to do the most prudent lady reminded him that it was better to bring the gifts of the kings on that same evening to the temple in order to be able to make the offering in silence and without noisy demonstration as was proper with all donations and sacrifices and that on the way he might procure the two turtle doves which on the next day were to be the public offering for the infant jesus saint joseph complied with her request as a stranger and one little known he gave the myrrh incense and gold to the one who usually received such gifts for the temple but saint joseph took care not to reveal himself to any one as the donor of these great presents although he could have bought the lamb which the rich usually offered for their firstborn he chose not to do so because the humble and poor apparel of the mother and the child as well as of the husband would not have agreed with a public offering as valuable as that of the rich matthew chapter eight verse twenty in no particular did the mother of wisdom deem it befitting to depart from poverty and humility even under the cover of a pious and honourable intention for in all things she was the teacher of perfection and her most holy son that of holy poverty in which he was born lived and died simeon as saint luke tells us was a just and god-fearing man and was hoping in the consolation of israel luke chapter two verse twenty four the holy ghost who dwelt in him had revealed to him that he should not taste death until he had seen the christ the lord moved by the holy spirit he came to the temple for in that night besides the revelations he had already received he was again divinely enlightened and made to understand more clearly the mysteries of the incarnation and redemption of man the fulfillment of the prophecies of isaiah that a virgin should conceive and bear a son and that from the root of jesse a flower should blossom namely christ isaiah chapter seven verse fourteen likewise all the rest contained in these and other prophecies he received a clear understanding of the hypostatic union of the two natures of the person of the word and of the mysteries of the passion and death of the redeemer thus instructed in these two high things saint simeon was lifted up and inflamed with the desire of seeing the redeemer of the world on the following day then as soon as he had received notice that christ was coming to present himself in the temple to the father 
he was carried in spirit to the temple for so great is the force of divine enlightenment whereupon succeeded that which i shall relate in the following chapter also the holy matron anne was favored with a revelation during the same night concerning many of these mysteries and great was the joy of her spirit on that account for as i have said in the first part of this history she had been the teacher of our queen during her stay in the temple the evangelist tells us that she never left the temple grounds serving in it day and night in prayer and fasting luke chapter one verse twenty seven that she was a prophetess daughter of samuel of the tribe of Aser. she had lived seven years with her husband and was now eighty years old as will be seen she spoke prophetically of the child's future instruction which the queen of heaven gave me my daughter one of the misfortunes which deprive souls of happiness or at least diminish it is that they content themselves with performing good works negligently or without fervor as if they were engaged in things unimportant or merely accidental on account of this ignorance and meanness of heart few of them arrive at an intimate friendship of god which they can attain only by fervent love this is called fervent precisely because of its similarity to boiling water for just as water is made to boil and foam by the fire so the soul by the sweet violence of the divine conflagration of love is raised above itself and above all created things as well as above its own doings in loving it is more and more inflamed and from this very love springs an unquenchable affection which makes the soul despise and forget all earthly things while at the same time it becomes dissatisfied with all temporal goodness and as the human heart when it does not attain what it dearly loves if that attainment is possible is inflamed with ever greater desire of reaching it by other means therefore the loving soul finds ever new things to strive after for the sake of the beloved and all service will seem to it but little thus it will pass from good will to a perfect will and from this to what will please the lord still more until it arrives at the most intimate union with him and at a perfect confirmation with the will of god hence thou wilt understand my dearest why i desired to go barefooted to the temple carrying at the same time my most holy son in order to present him there and why i also wished to comply with the law of the purification for urged on by my love which incessantly demanded what was most perfect and agreeable to the lord i sought the fullness of perfection in all my doings and it was precisely this anxiety which created in me such a desire of excellence in all my works labor to imitate me with all diligence in all that i did for i assure thee my dear that it is this exercise of thy love which the most high is desiring and expecting of thee and as is mentioned by the spouse in the canticles canticles chapter two verse nine he is watching thee so close at hand that not more than a slight screen intervenes between the soul and its vision of the lord enamoured and drawn onward he approaches closely to those souls who thus love and serve him in all things while he withdraws from the lukewarm and negligent ones or only deals with them according to the general rules of his divine providence do thou aspire continually to the most pure and perfect in the practice of virtues and study and invent new schemes and projects of love so that all the forces of thy interior and exterior faculties continue to be zealously occupied in what is most exalted and excellent in the service of the lord at the same time mention all these affections to thy spiritual father and subject them to the obedience and advice of thy counsellor following his instructions for this will always be the most preferable and secure way. End of chapter 19 Book 2, Chapter 20 of The Mystical City of God, Volume 2, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 20 the presentation of the infant jesus in the temple and what happened on that occasion the sacred humanity of christ belonged to the eternal father not only because it was created like other beings but it was his special property by virtue of the hypostatic union with the person of the word 
for this person of the word being his only begotten son was engendered of his substance true god of true god nevertheless the eternal father had decreed that his son should be presented to him in the temple in mysterious compliance with the law of which christ our lord was the end romans chapter ten verse four it was established for no other purpose than that the just men of the old testament should perpetually sanctify and offer to the lord their firstborn sons in the hope that one thus presented might prove to be the son of god and a child of the mother of the expected messiahs exodus chapter thirteen verse two according to our way of thinking his majesty acted like men who are apt to repeat and enjoy over and over again a thing that has caused them enjoyment for although the father understood and knew all things in his infinite wisdom he sought pleasure in the offering of the incarnate word which by so many titles already belonged to him this will of the eternal father which was conformable to that of his son in so far as he was god was known to the mother of life and of the human nature of the word for she saw that all his interior actions were in unison with the will of his eternal father full of this holy science the great princess passed the night before his presentation in the temple in divine colloquies speaking to the father she said my lord and god most high father of my lord a festive day for heaven and earth will that be in which i shall bring and offer to thee in thy holy temple the living host which is at the same time the treasure of thy divinity rich o oh my lord and god is this oblation and thou canst well pour forth in return for it thy mercies upon the human race pardoning the sinners that have turned from the straight path consoling the afflicted helping the needy enriching the poor succoring the weak enlightening the blind and meeting those who have strayed away this is my lord what i ask of thee in offering to thee thy only begotten who by thy merciful condescension is also my son if thou hast given him to me as a god i return him to thee as god and man his value is infinite and what i ask of thee is much less in opulence do i return to thy holy temple from which i departed poor and my soul shall magnify thee for ever because thy divine right hand has shown itself toward me so liberal and powerful on the next morning the sun of heaven being now ready to issue from its purest dawning the virgin mary on whose arms he reclined and being about to rise up in full view of the world the heavenly lady having provided the turtle dove and two candles wrapped him in swaddling clothes and betook herself with saint joseph from their lodging to the temple the holy angels who had come with them from bethlehem again formed a procession in corporeal and most beautiful forms just as has been said concerning the journey of the preceding day on this occasion however the holy spirits added many other hymns of the sweetest and most entrancing harmony in honour of the infant god which were heard only by the most pure mary besides the ten thousand who had formed the procession on the previous day innumerable others descended from heaven who accompanied by those that bore the shields of the holy name of jesus formed the guard of honour of the incarnate word on the occasion of his presentation these however were not in corporeal shapes and only the heavenly princess perceived their presence having arrived at the temple gate the most blessed mother was filled with new and exalted sentiments of devotion joining the other women she bowed and knelt to adore the lord in spirit and in truth in his holy temple and she presented herself before the exalted majesty of god with his son upon her arms john chapter four verse twenty three immediately she was immersed in an intellectual vision of the most holy trinity and she heard a voice issuing from the eternal father saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased matthew chapter twenty seven verse twenty saint joseph the most fortunate of men felt at the same time a new sweetness of the holy ghost which filled him with joy and divine light the holy high priest simeon moved by the holy ghost as explained in the preceding chapter also entered the temple at that time luke chapter two verse twenty seven 
approaching the place where the queen stood with the infant jesus in her arms she saw both mother and child enveloped in splendor and glory the prophetess anne who as the evangelist says had come at the same hour also saw mary and her infant surrounded by this wonderful light in the joy of their spirit both of them approached the queen of heaven and the priest received the infant jesus from her arms upon his hands raising up his eyes to heaven he offered him up to the eternal father pronouncing at the same time these words so full of mysteries now dost thou dismiss thy servant o lord according to thy word in peace because my eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all the peoples a light for the revelation of the gentiles and the glory of thy people israel luke chapter 2 verse 29 it was as if he had said now lord thou wilt release me from the bondage of this mortal body and let me go free and in peace for until now i have been detained in it by the hope of seeing thy promises fulfilled and by the desire of seeing thy only begotten made man now that my eyes have seen thy salvation the only begotten made man joined to our nature in order to give it eternal welfare according to the intention and eternal decree of thy infinite wisdom and mercy i shall enjoy true and secure peace now o lord thou hast prepared and placed before all mortals thy divine light that it may shine upon the world and that all who wish may enjoy it throughout the universe and derive therefrom guidance and salvation for this is the light which is revealed to the gentiles for the glory of thy chosen people of israel first letter of john chapter nine verse thirty two most holy mary and saint joseph heard this canticle of simeon wondering at the exalted revelation it contained the evangelist calls them in this place the parents of the divine infant for such they were in the estimation of the people who were present at this event simeon addressing himself to the most holy mother of the infant jesus then added behold this child is set for the fall and for the resurrection of many in israel and for a sign which shall be contradicted and thy own soul a sword shall pierce that out of many hearts thoughts may be revealed thus saint simeon and being a priest he gave his blessing to the happy parents of the child then also the prophetess anne acknowledged the incarnate word and full of the holy ghost she spoke of the mysteries of the messiahs to many who were expecting the redemption of israel by these two holy old people public testimony of the coming of the redeemer was given to the world at the moment when the priest simeon mentioned the sword and the sign of contradiction which were prophetical of the passion and death of the lord the child bowed its head thereby and by many interior acts of obedience jesus ratified the prophecy of the priest and accepted it as the sentence of the eternal father pronounced by his minister all this the loving mother noticed and understood she presently began to feel the sorrow predicted by simeon and thus in advance she was wounded by the sword of which she had thus been warned as in a mirror her spirit was made to see all the mysteries included in this prophecy how her most holy son was to be the stone of stumbling the perdition of the unbelievers and the salvation of the faithful the fall of the synagogue and the establishment of the church among the heathens she foresaw the triumph to be gained over the devils and over death but also that a great price was to be paid for it namely the frightful agony and death of the cross letter to the colossians chapter two verse fifteen she foresaw the boundless opposition and contradiction which the lord jesus was to sustain both personally and in his church john chapter fifteen verse twenty at the same time she also saw the glory and excellence of the predestined souls most holy mary knew it all and in the joy and sorrow of her most pure soul excited by the prophecies of simeon and these hidden mysteries she performed heroic acts of virtue all these sayings and happenings were indelibly impressed upon her memory and of all that she understood and experienced she forgot not the least iota at all times she looked upon her most holy son with such a living sorrow as we mere human creatures with hearts so full of ingratitude shall never be able to feel 
the holy spouse saint joseph was by these prophecies also made to see many of the mysteries of the redemption and of the labors and sufferings of jesus but the lord did not reveal them to him so copiously and openly as they were perceived and understood by his heavenly spouse for in him these revelations were to serve a different purpose and besides saint joseph was not to be an eye-witness of them during his mortal life the ceremony of the presentation thus being over the great lady kissed the hand of the priest and again asked his blessing the same she did also to anne her former teacher for her dignity as mother of god the highest possible to angels or men did not prevent her from these acts of deepest humility then in the company of saint joseph her spouse and of the fourteen thousand angels in procession she returned with the divine infant to her lodging they remained as i shall relate farther on for some days in jerusalem in order to satisfy their devotion and during that time she spoke a few times with the priest about the mysteries of the redemption and of the prophecies above mentioned although the words of the most prudent virgin mother were few measured and reserved they were also so weighty and full of wisdom that they filled the priest with wonder and excited in him the most exalted and the sweetest sentiments of joy in his soul the same happened also to the prophetess anne both of them died in the lord shortly afterwards the holy family lodged at the expense of simeon during these days the queen frequented the temple and in it she was visited with many favors and consolations in recompense for the sorrow caused by the prophecies of the priest in order to heighten their sweetness her most holy son spoke to her on one of these days saying my dearest mother and my dove dry up thy tears and let thy purest heart be expanded since it is the will of my father that i accept the death of the cross i desire that thou be my companion in my labors and sufferings i long to undergo them for the souls who are the works of my hands letter to the ephesians chapter two verse ten made according to my image and likeness in order to make them partakers of my reign and of eternal life in triumph over my enemies letter to the colossians chapter two verse fifteen this is what thou thyself dost wish in union with me the mother answered o oh, my sweetest love and son of my womb if my accompanying thee shall include not only the privilege of witnessing and pitying thy sufferings but also of dying with thee so much the greater will be my relief for it will be a greater suffering for me to live while seeing thee die in these exercises of love and compassion she passed some days until saint joseph was advised to fly into egypt as i shall relate in the following chapter instruction which the most holy queen mary gave me my daughter the doctrine and example contained in the foregoing chapter will teach thee to strive after the constancy and expansion of heart by which thou mayest prepare thyself to accept blessings and adversity the sweet and the bitter with equanimity o oh, dearest soul how narrow and unwilling is the human heart toward that which is contrary and distasteful to its earthly inclinations how it chafes in labors how impatiently it meets them how insufferable it deems all that is contrary to its desires how persistently it forgets that its teacher and master has first accepted sufferings and has honored and sanctified them in his own person it is a great shame yea a great boldness on the part of the faithful that they should abhor suffering even after my most holy son did suffer for them and when so many of the just before his death were led to embrace the cross solely by the hope that christ would once suffer upon it although they would never live to see it and if this want of correspondence is so base in others consider well my dearest how vile it would be in thee who art so anxious to obtain the grace and the friendship of the most high who desirest to merit the name of a spouse and friend of god who wishes to belong entirely to him and that he belong entirely to thee who wishes to be my disciple and that i be thy teacher who aspirest to follow and imitate me as a faithful daughter her mother matthew chapter seven verse twenty one all this must not result in mere sentiment and in empty words or oft-repeated exclamations of lord lord 
and when the occasion of tasting the chalice and the cross of suffering is at hand thou must not turn away in sorrow and affliction from the sufferings by which the sincerity of a loving and affectionate heart is to be tried all this would be denying in your actions what you profess in your words and it would be a swerving from the path of eternal life for thou canst not follow christ if thou refusest to embrace the cross and rejoice in it nor shalt thou find me by any other way matthew chapter eight verse thirty four if creatures fail thee if temptation or trouble assail thee if the sorrows of death encompass thee psalm seventeen verse five thou must in no wise be disturbed or disheartened since nothing displeases my most holy son or me more than placing a hindrance or misapplying the grace given by him for thy defence by misusing it and receiving it in vain thou yieldest great victory to the demon who glories much in having disturbed or subjected any soul that calls itself a disciple of christ and of me and having once brought thee to default in small things he will soon oppress thee in greater ones confide then in the protection of the most high and press onward trusting in me full of this trust whenever tribulation comes over thee fervently exclaim the lord is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear psalm twenty six verse one he is my helper why should i hesitate i have a mother a queen and mistress who will assist me and take care of me in my affliction in this security seek to preserve interior peace and keep forever in thy view my works and my footsteps for thy imitation remember the sorrow which pierced my heart at the prophecies of simeon and how i remained in peace and tranquillity without any sign of disturbance although my heart and soul were transfixed by a sword of pain in every event i sought motives for glorifying and adoring his admirable wisdom if the transitory labors and sufferings are accepted with joy and with serenity of heart they spiritualize the creature they elevate it and furnish it with a divine insight by which the soul begins to esteem affliction at its proper value and soon finds consolation and the blessings of mortification and of freedom from disorderly passions this is the teaching of the school of the redeemer hidden from those living in babylon and from those who love vanity matthew chapter eleven verse twenty five i wish also that thou imitate me in respecting the priests and ministers of the lord who in the new law hold a much higher dignity than in the old since the divine word has now united itself with human nature and become the eternal high priest according to the order of melchizedek psalm 109 verse 4 listen to their words and instructions as god requires whose place they take consider the power and authority given them in the gospels where it is said who hears you hears me who obeys you obeys me luke chapter 10 verse 16 strive after the perfection they teach thee ponder and meditate without intermission upon that which my most holy son suffered so that thy soul be a participant in his sorrows let the pious memory of his sufferings engender in thee such a disgust and abhorrence of all earthly pleasures that thou despise and forget all that is visible and instead follow the author of eternal life End of chapter twenty